it's interesting to think about that a lot of us here are involved in technology and when we come to design uh, our, future, uh, our future network systems, we can ask what we can learn from nature. So never before have we communicated on such mass scale as we do today with the internet. And how do we actually communicate with each other? Today we can tag and track data in real time through Facebook and Twitter. And we want to make sense of all these communications and what is it mean to communicate between us. And can we actually visualize these communications? But in fact, some uh, studies show that most of the data stops at 93% of the node itself, of the first node itself. So in this petri plate dish, we have 10 billion bacteria, of bacteria, 10 times more than all the population on Earth. Yet they communicate and coordinate their actions as a colony. So how do they actually communicate with each other? But before we go a little bit deeper into bacteria communication systems, I want to introduce to you three very intelligent bacteria I'm working with the penicillus bacteria. Now you might ask, what is bacteria communication? What is bacteria intelligence? And why are these bacteria so intelligent? And how do we actually measure bacteria intelligence? Well, basically it's uh, mostly um, based on their um, collective decision making as a colony itself. These bacteria here in the center of the vortex, the left one is the C and the right one is the T are found 20, more than 20 years ago by Professor Eshel Ben Yaakov from Tel Aviv University. So you, if you know a little bit about bacteria, you know that it's a single cell organism, but these bacteria work together as a multi-cell organism with abilities to um, self-organize themselves and work together as a colony collectively. <laughs> Eventually, what fascinates me here is the final result. Apart from their um, abilities to communicate with each other and their um, beautiful structures and morphological patterns, is that maybe eventually we can consider this as a visual representation for communication systems. So trained by Eshel Ben Yaakov in his lab, I was able to take these practices back into Berkeley, New York, where I co-founded a biology lab called GemSpace. It's a citizen science biotech community lab in Brooklyn, New York, um, in 33 Flatbush Avenue, if you're interested. Um, and this enabled me to expand these notions of a lab as a studio space. When I come to the lab today, I come to play and discover I come with questions, come as an artist, naive, to look at rather than to look for. And this enabled me to experiment and to fail and discover, just as I do in my art practices in my studio. So I started testing the bacteria for its intelligence. And one of my first experiments was, does it understand space? As you know, the bacteria is um, seated on a petri plate with nutrients, with a very um, distinctive environment settings for the bacteria itself. So when I start to understand if it understands space, first I gave it two different sizes of petri plates, for example. And when I came back to the lab, I realized that the results were <laughs> definitely changed a lot. So as you can see, in the top plates, the smaller ones, and in the bottom plate, which are the bigger ones, the bacteria didn't wait to reach the edge of the plate to understand that it's blocking food source. As if it had GPS systems in its place, it understood from the beginning how to calculate and measure the pattern growth in the plates themselves. Then I later started doing more experiments and understanding how they understand space, more three-dimensional space that resembles more our body or nature. And these were some of the results. Realized that the bacteria is 
we're able to slide slow and climb very sharp angles. And I was very interested to apply these techniques furthermore. As you know, agar is like jello. When it's warm, it's liquid, and when it cools down, it solidifies. So I was able to experiment further and apply sound frequencies to create more uh, complex topographies to the agar itself. So I set it on the speakers while it solidifies. Solidified and applying different sound frequencies or sound waves to it. Then I invited sound artists and friends into the lab and created more complex sound frequencies, sound, um, sounds of the bacteria itself. And as these experiments became more complex, we took it back uh, to the gallery and to museum spaces. I was very interested um, to share these experiments that are usually um, occur in behind closed lab doors with the public itself. And these are some of the results that came up from these experiments. And as you can see, for example, with the vortex from the very top left to the very bottom right, the results are really um, extreme. So for example, in the top right, with a triangle wave and 200 hertz versus a square wave with 1,000 hertz, they behave completely different. Another thing that happened here, which was very interesting, the projector is hard to see the exact results, but the C and the T, for example, are um, very similar species, more than the vortex. And usually, if you see one of them on the environment of the other, they start changing their morphological characteristics. And what happened here with the sound wave, they started shifting back and forth on the same plate itself. So these results, in addition to the three-dimensional results, um, were very interested, uh, uh, interesting back to the scientists. And that was probably the first time that I felt as an artist useful in a science lab. Something else that was um, very interesting happened during my experiments was usually scientists would grow the bacteria in an incubator in 30 to 37 degrees Celsius. And I often grow them in room temperature to simulate conditions of lab, uh, of uh, gallery and museum spaces. And one time I was in a hurry with some results I needed to achieve, and I put them in the incubator. And I came back after a few days, and I saw this, the blur. And I was wondering if these are social bacteria, then obviously they are antisocial here at all, and they don't know how to communicate with each other. And I was very curious about what happened here. And after a few days of thinking about it over and over again, I realized that basically they were happy. They were warm and fuzzy, and they had plenty of food in the incubator. And when I went back to my three-dimensional experiments, I realized that actually in areas where it was very easy for them to slide they made no effort at all, while in areas where they had slopey angles or they had to make more efforts, they had to um, be more creative, they had more problem-solving issues to deal with. So what does it say about us? When do we solve problems in a more creative way? Is it only in times of struggle, or in times of stress, in times of war? So just to end it, because I say we're out of time, um, these are some of the results and close-ups from these experiments. And this is just one of the uh, projects done in Genspace. There's many others. Uh, projects and I encourage you to check us online.